All right. We got the whole board uh, from Adam to, well, you don't see Jacob yet. We'll get to Jacob, right? Uh, Adam to Abraham. What is the, as we'll review every day, every Wednesday, what is the problem that God is trying to solve? Separation, Separation from God, right? The problem of death that Adam and Eve started, and he's going to do it through Abraham. What is the promise, two promises, I guess, that uh, God gives to Abraham? Through him all nations will be blessed. Genesis 12, verse 3, right? And we know that promise would be fulfilled in whom? In Jesus. What else does God promise Abraham? Sure, uh, many children, but also all nations would be blessed through him. You'd have descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And also, you would have some place to live. The promised land, right? The land of Canaan you will inhabit. So we get to see that kind of thread at play as well as we go into Isaac's story. Okay, last week we talked about the, the sacrifice of Isaac, but now Isaac ha has grown up. Obviously, Isaac was spared by God, and now the promise will be fulfilled through him. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 24, and there's going to be a little bit of a cute stories today, a lot of romance, kind of, marriages, um, and a lot of messes as well, as, as it tends to happen. So, the story of Isaac and Rebekah, chapter 24. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, and that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the, will, if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Notice the character development in Abraham. How confident is Abraham that the servant's going to find a wife for his son? Yes! Uh, God will send an angel to make sure you do it, because God swore to me to your offspring I will give this land. Uh, Abraham has learned a valuable lesson that when God makes a promise, he will always keep it no matter how impossible it seems to be kept. Billy. Why do you have to go to uh, another country? Or another? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Where is Abraham right now? He is in the land of Canaan. Who are the Canaanites? Does anyone know? Remember where the Canaanites came from? Who this is a tough. This is a tough question. Um, the, of, um, the brother, the it's the son of Noah and the brother of Shem. Ham. Ham. Does anyone remember what Ham did? That was so bad. He uncovered his father's nakedness, right? And, and laughed about it and told his, his brothers about it. He dishonored his father. So the Canaanites from that line, were they holy, righteous people? No. Also, Billy, God promised Abraham from whose offspring will inherit the land? Will the Canaanites inherit the land? 
No, from Abraham's people, from you guys, you'll inherit this land. This is, this is interesting. Why, multiple times in this section, Abraham tells the servant, don't let my son go anywhere. Why? Because he wants to make sure that Isaac marries one of his people from his tribe. Does that make sense? That God might keep his promises. It's very interesting uh, commentary about uh, arranged marriages here, too. Because that's what we're getting to, right? That the servant's going to go choose a wife for Isaac. Is what Abraham is doing, is it wrong? It's in the family. It's, it's not outside the family. Okay. I would say maybe it is wrong because you're not letting, you're trying to control God's work. Like if God does, if he's trying to control his son from not meeting anybody else, from meeting a certain person. Okay. So you should leave it up to God. Okay. Does Abraham himself choose a wife for Isaac? Where's Where's Abraham right now? He's in Canaan. What do we hear about him? What do we hear about Abraham in the first verse? He's old and he's dying. Abraham is probably on the deathbed right now, and what he wants to make sure is that Isaac marries someone that will keep in God's promise. Now we're going to talk about this if we get we get further in with Jacob and Esau, especially Esau, because uh, Esau married Canaanites and departed from God's will. But Abraham doesn't want to force Isaac to do something. Abraham wants Isaac to keep God's will. He's giving him direction. Now we're very Romeo and Juliet pills in America. This this belief that. Uh, you know, parents and family should have no decision on who we choose to be, our, our wives, our husbands, right? Uh, but I think the Bible kind of has some, uh, a lesson for us here that maybe just maybe when parents give guidance and advice to their kids about whom they should marry, uh, that's not a negative thing. In fact, maybe that's just being a good mom and a good dad when, when one of your daughters brings a guy over and you feel uh, about it, that uh, maybe you should speak up and talk to them. I think the modern culture of, you know, I'll support anyone you marry uh, may not be what the Bible paints. Now, maybe it might not be as extreme as arranged marriages, but if you want my radical takes on that, I have some radical opinions about that. Uh, but I certainly think that the guidance of parents is a good thing uh, for their children. That's how you love your children. Lori. I know in the past, men used to ask the father for the daughter's hand for marriage. Yes. Permission. Yes. In, in America. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Again, we we're all we're all you know Disney Romeo and Juliet pilled now, where it's just like you know you decide for yourself. And and again, you know there is still some freedom there, but I think it's the job of the parents to provide guidance because guess what? When you're 19, do you know anything? No. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do mom and dad maybe have some wisdom they can share through uh, years of happy or unhappy marriage? Uh, I, I think so. And so th that's, I think, a good illustration that the Bible paints here. Okay? Questions on that? Oh, one more thing about this section. What is this whole uh, hand on the thigh thing? Okay, so... The servant is said to make an oath with Abraham by putting the hand on the, underneath the thigh. What on earth is that, though? What does that mean? A little strange. <laughs> it is a little strange. In fact, it only appears one other place in Scripture. It appears at the end of Genesis when Jacob makes uh, Joseph and his sons I think, I think it is Joseph. We'll find out in a couple weeks. Uh, promise that he would be buried in the promised land, not in Egypt. Under the thigh may be a euphemism. It might be describing more at the loins. This is kind of like a very extreme promise that has to do with family lines, right? Uh, the descendants. What is Abraham asking the servant to do, but basically continue the family line? This is a huge, huge promise here. 
Why the custom is under the thigh, we may never know, at least on this side of heaven. Oh, he didn't have a Bible, maybe, right? But this is a, certainly a, a very intimate right. promise the servant is making. And is this any servant? No, the head servant. The head servant, the, the oldest servant, the one in charge of all. As Abraham is dying on his deathbed, the, uh, this servant is the one to, to in charge of Abraham's estate. So Abraham really wasn't doing anything necessarily bad because he was just making sure that his child would marry into somebody that would be following Exactly, exactly. Okay. And you're going to see very shortly, Rachel, uh, I don't think Abraham or the servant chooses Isaac's wife. I think God does. We'll get to that. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Then the servant, this is verse 10, took ten of his master's camels and departed taking all sorts of choice gifts from the ma his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of the evening, the time when women go out to draw water. By the way, why are wells so important? We hear about wells all the time in the Old Testament. It's like desert, there's no, unless there's a river nearby, there's no water. Okay, desert, there's no water. There's, how do we get water now? We have... You know, we, we have wells. <laughs> yes, we have wells to aquifers, right? But all industrialized. But for in ancient Israel, a well was like liquid gold. Mm -hmm. Oil's liquid gold now, but back then, water was liquid gold because you used that water not just for yourself, but also for your flocks, mm -hmm. for your camels. So whole towns would be built around wells. The women would go to get water at the well every morning. It would be a place of social gathering. The well was kind of like the center of the town because that's where they accessed water in a desert climate, right? Let's keep going. Verse 12. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the woman to whom I shall say, please let you down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. But this, by this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, Behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethel, the son of Milcah, and the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave, her a, gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. I love the Old Testament in kind of bits like this when the narrative slows down a little bit. We stop talking about generations and we start talking about like the very human interactions between people. What does a servant do at the well? He prays for what? The Lord to bring her. How so? How would he know the one that the Lord has chosen for Isaac? Give him a drink and give his animals a drink. And we see, and I think in verse, is it verse 15? Or where am I? Oh man, I lost my... Back, uh, yeah, verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, before he was even done praying, who shows herself? Rebecca. A total hottie. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Very attractive in appearance. The Bible says, the Bible doesn't, uh, um, <laughs> hide from that kind of stuff. Yes, yes. 
And not only does Rebecca do what the servant prayed for, how does she do it? She was nice. She was nice? What else? She doesn't just she walk. Ran she me. runs. She runs to do this. So not only does she show kindness, she shows extreme hospi hospitality to this complete and utter stranger. And I love the servant's reaction. What does the servant do when she, he sees her doing this? Before that, verse 21. He looks like this. <laughs> like he can't believe his eyes, right? That's what kind of the Bible is saying. He, he's gazing in silence. He, I just, I literally prayed for this, this moment, and she ran out. Is maybe God at work here? Uh, I think this is a blessing from God. Let's keep going. Verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there a room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore in a whore. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way of the house of my master's kinsmen. And the young man ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. He said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks with herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to him he has given all he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house, and to my clan, and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife of my son from my clan and t from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when, she co when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out of draw water, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your, my, your jar to drink. And who will say to me, Drink, that I may draw from your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. And before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on your shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let her down her jar from her shoulders and said, drink and I will give your camel's drink also. So I drank and she gave me the camel's drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or the left. 
Then Laban and Bethel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. What is significant about their response? Oh, Billy, yes. Yes. Well, it's just, it's just a customary way, place where they wore jewelry, right? I think the more important question in that is, what's with the servant giving Rebecca all this jewelry? Why do you think he did that? It's almost like a dowry. Almost like a dowry. Well, we'll see that more in a few moments. What else? Okay, I, I think so. She, uh, he believed that the Lord had appointed her. Who is a servant to Laban and to Laban's father but a random stranger? Hey, I'm going to pick up your wife and take her home. Or take, I'm going to pick up your sister and take her home with me. It's a pretty big ask. Uh, how does the servant kind of advertise his position a little bit more? Who does he serve? Abraham. Abraham. And is Abraham poor? No. Abraham is one of the wealthiest men out there, right? Uh, if your daughter, if your sister comes with me, she will be well, well taken care of. Look at the bracelets and the jewelry I could just give to her. Okay? So uh, the servant comes bringing gifts to kind of show these two men what would be in store for their family member. What is significant about their reaction, Laban's reaction? This random stranger shows up. They believe. Yeah. This thing has come from the Lord. This thing has come from the Lord. In other words, when this stranger is saying, uh, Rebecca is the Lord's appointed for my master's son, how easy it would be them be for them to say, That is ridiculous. Who are you? I just met you. Rather, they say, we believe. We can't judge for ourselves. We can't say whether it's bad or good. But what has happened is happening. So uh, she may go with you. Say again? Bye. 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 Oh, yes. <laughs> Questions on this. Now, again, Rebecca does not... Well, actually, I take that back. Rebecca may choose for herself. Give me a second. We'll keep, we'll keep going to that. <clears throat> We'll go to verse, where was I? Verse uh, 52. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. This might be more of the bridal price you were talking about, Gil. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were there with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days after that she, she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord had prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and, Ab with Ab and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. So what does this say about Rebekah's character? She believes, she believes as well. All right. Is this a righteous woman? We can see from her behavior at the well, uh, but also we can see in this trust of God that she is the Lord's appointed for Isaac. Questions on this section so far? A lot of this is just solid narrative. Uh, it's a lot of just, just story. It's how the story ends. <clears throat> Verse 62. 
Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negeb. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Yes, yeah, a nice story. You, got, the, yeah, you, were, you were holding on to see if something went awfully wrong. Well, there'll, there'll, there'll be things that go wrong. Don't worry. But the, any, anyway, I got a question. Isaac is out in the field and he sees Rebecca and his servant coming. And when Rebecca finds out that that's her future husband out there, what does she do? She puts on a veil. Why does she do that? Is there any other place, maybe even today, we hear about veils being put on? During a wedding. So what is Rebecca doing for herself? She's getting married. This, is, this might sound like a Vegas wedding or something, right? But she is preparing to marry Isaac. Going back to her character. She has told, was told that the Lord had appointed her to be Isaac's wife. And did she believe it? She believed from the moment she saw Isaac in the distance. All right, this is what I'm here to do. I'm here to be Isaac's wife, to continue the promise, to be the, uh, well, to keep the line going, right? That's who Rebecca would be. It is a nice story, right? We see uh, God, at, God at work here, right? And through Isaac, of course. Um, Abraham and Sarah were probably, by the time the servant got back, both of them were probably dead at that point. So uh, Isaac was, was alone. And uh, God provided for him uh, to keep that promise going. Let's keep going. We're definitely not getting a chapter. There's no chance. Uh, chapter 25, oh, this is, we're going we're gonna to just breeze through chapter 25. We hear about more of Abraham's descendants. We also hear about the descendants of Ishmael, right? Um, as the nations grow bigger and bigger. I'm trying to think if there's anything I wanted to highlight from this first section of chapter 25. Uh, where was Abraham buried? Was he buried in a foreign land? He was buried in the land God had promised him. He was buried with Sarah, as we see in verse 11. All right. Uh, also, one more thing. In verse 16 of chapter 25, we hear about the descendants of Ishmael and how there were 12 princes born of his descendants. That actually is a fulfillment of one of God's promises. Back, and I think it was in Genesis chapter 8, or 17, I'm sorry, 17, uh, verse 20 of chapter 17. God says to Abraham, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitfully multiply greatly. He shall father twelve princes. What God promises. And then in chapter 25, we see the fulfillment of that promise. Again, when God makes a promise, he fulfills it every time. Okay. Jacob and Esau. It's verse 19 we're going to start. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethel, the Armean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Armean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed the Lord for his wife because she was barren. How long was Rebekah barren for? This is a detail we actually don't highlight very often. Isaac is 40 years old when he takes Rebekah as his wife. If you skip ahead to verse 26, when the two children are born, it says Isaac is how many? How old? So how long was Rebecca barren for? 20 years. A long time. Kind of sounds familiar. 
Sarah. Okay, maybe there's a connection here, right? Uh, and by the way, it goes back to this theme I've been talking about that where do children come from? What does the Bible say they come from? God, right? The Father in heaven. Uh, and we'll see even more on that when we get to the story of uh, uh, Jacob's wives, right? And all this stuff they get into. The children are a blessing come from God. And of course, uh, would Rebecca have children to keep the promise going? Absolutely. Let's keep going. Verse 21. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled within her and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So, what does this mean? The word struggled within her, actually in the Hebrew, it actually uh, it, it, it's the word for crushed. So these two kids are crushing each other in the womb. So uh, is that an easy, fun pregnancy for Rebecca? Uh, not at all. And so Rebecca says, uh, why is this happening to me? Why are my two babies fighting in my womb? And God answers. God says, this is a prophecy. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. These two were still attached to each other, fighting as they're coming out of Rebecca. So his name was called Jacob. The name Jacob literally means he who holds the heel, right? The heel, which can also mean uh, cheater or usurper. This may have some foreshadowing, Rachel. We'll see, right? What was the promise of God? That the younger would serve... I'm sorry, the other way. The older would serve the younger. Flies in the face of how the culture was at the time, right? Because the firstborn receives what? The inheritance. The birthright, everything. He gets the father's estate. The younger being served by the older, that seems ridiculous. Who's the younger in this case? Esau or Jacob? Jacob is the younger. Just by a few moments, poor guy. He misses out on the inheritance. Oh, wait. I think something's going to happen next. <clears throat> All right, the, afterward his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So how would you describe these two boys? <laughs> Introvert, extrovert, a little bit, yes. Opposites. Uh, maybe uh, Jacob was the white collar worker and then uh, Esau was the blue collar worker working in the fields. Esau was probably a, a stronger man, while Jacob was probably you know, the quiet guy who wrote poems and was in the tents, right? And the parents had favorites. Isaac's favorite was Esau, and Rebecca's favorite was Jacob. Surely that won't lead to trouble later. <clears throat> Verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of the, that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. By the way, this, this side note here seems kind of weird. Uh, from Esau's descendants would come the Edomites. Edom is, it comes from a, a Hebrew word, Edom on. Edomoni, that's how you pronounce it, right? Sorry, I'm not a native Hebrew speaker. Let's see where it was. I think, I think that's what it was. Edomoni, which means red. So the Edomites, the, the red people. Okay, so that's where that note comes from. So Esau's other name was Edom itself. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. 
So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is Abel or Cain uh, over again. <laughs> Maybe Abel or Cain. Who's the hero in this story? I don't think you have one. I don't think you have one either. What do you mean by birthright? Birthright would be the inheritance. Okay, so he's the father's he's estate. He's inside doing nothing, and then all of a sudden he's making stew and he's like, "Hey, give me your birthright. I'll give you some stew." Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, e Esau. So, so Jacob, the man called cheater. Usurper? What's a usurper with a one that conquers someone else? Maybe that's a fitting name. Uh, Jacob is just in the tent, and Esau, after a hard day's work, exhausted and starving, I need food. And is Jacob the most loving brother in the world? No love between, no love between. No love between them. So is Jacob a hero here? No. Is Esau a hero here? <laughs> We're going to find out more about Esau in, in the future, that uh, Esau is a man of the flesh, he's a man of the world, and thus he hates his birthright, he hates, uh, you know, uh, what the, f the responsibility he has by his father. Uh, we'll see more of that in a second, just the woman he, he chooses to marry. He's the one supposed to be the one who continues the promise that through Abraham's people would come uh, uh, the blessing of the whole world, and yet he chooses to marry people that spoilers, are not part of Abraham's uh, tribe. We'll get to that in a second. So neither of these two are heroes. Is the Bible praising Jacob here? No. We're kind of neutral observers. I just want to get back to what I spoke about a couple weeks ago, for the last couple weeks, uh, descriptive things versus prescriptive things. Are we being told by Moses, who's writing this, that we should be doing this? treating people's inheritance? No. This is just what happens. Okay? Questions on that? No. Keep going. Verse 26. Oh, this is a great one. one or chapter 26. Esau was the first. Yes. And had the inheritance. Yes. He was about to die if he didn't get food. Who would have got it when Esau passed? <laughs> so that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting point, right? I thought about this a little bit. Was Esau really like about to die? Or was he was he just lazy? Did he really not care about his birthright that much? Mm -hmm. Right? So I, I mentioned before, right, Esau's just a man of the world. He, he doesn't really care about the responsibility he has as one of the chosen line. Uh, so maybe in his foolishness, he does this. In the book of Hebrews, it actually talks about Esau and his ungodliness. And this might be a demonstration of that. So maybe he really, hey, well, he wasn't like two seconds from starving to death. By the way, you know, you really don't say starve to death instantly, do you? It takes a long, long time. This might be a more reflection of Esau's character here. Uh, good question, Gil. But when you're hungry and tired, I mean, someone's like, Oh, sure, you get, you get hangry, you get desperate, right? Okay. Certainly. Okay. Whatever, thank you. All right, let's keep going. Now, there's a famine in the land. Besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Do you remember Abimelech? Yes. What happened with Abimelech and Abraham? Yes. He called Sarah his sister so that he might be spared. Certainly Isaac is a smarter man than that. Well, yes. Yes. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn, travel in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring and the stars of the heaven and give you to you your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring... All the nations of the world shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. It's an interesting point here. Abraham's gone. Did uh, God say, well, because Abraham's gone, I'm not going to keep my promise anymore? No, he, he, he keep, 
He's going to keep his promise through Isaac. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. Comedy, right? It's just comedy. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out the window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech, poor guy, called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. What is this the sister thing? Does the Bible have humor in it? Imagine being an ancient Israelite and hearing the story of this repeated, how many times? Once, twice, now three times. It, 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 it is straight, it's just comedy, right? And, and by the way, uh, do we see that is Isaac just that much more righteous than his father? That's right. They come with the same exact strategy. The sins of the father goes to the sins of the son. Uh, Abraham didn't teach Isaac, apparently, you know, you can trust in God's promises. Don't worry about Abimelech. He likes us. Don't worry. He likes us. And notice, Abimelech didn't even try anything this time. Right? Abimelech didn't bring it. Yeah, Abimelech didn't bring Re Rebecca in. He's, he's learned. Uh, but certainly, uh, Isaac is still a sinner. God is working through broken people here. It's comedy, though. Kiss, kiss, it's, just kiss. It's, I mean, it, it almost makes me feel like it's somebody who's like, oh, this is my sister. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, like, everybody's driving around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I love it. Abimelech's reaction is like he's, he's much more prepared this time. Yes. Questions on this? We're going to skip ahead. In the rest of the chapter, we hear about how um, Isaac dwells in the land of Abimelech. Isaac is not as kind of brave as his father, though. Uh, Isaac will go to a well and start digging it out. And he'll have a well there, and there'll be water, and the people around him said, actually, that's our well, that's our, our property. So he would go to another well. He'd actually back off, okay, instead of fighting himself. He would just say, all right, it's not my problem, and he'd go to another well. And he'd dig it up, same thing. Everyone would say, oh, that's our well. Okay, I'll find another spot. Sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. And he'd find a third well. Finally, at that third well, he found a place to stay. He was unwelcome in these lands, and yet, you know, he might have been either easier softer or kinder, but he was kind of beaten around a little bit, unlike his father Abraham. But eventually, God continued to bless Isaac, and Abimelech saw that. And Abimelech came to Isaac and said, Make an oath with us, that, because we see God is with you. Never fight us, because we know we'd lose. Please spare us. And Isaac promises to uh, not ever attack Abimelech. That's the rest of this chapter. But the last verse I want to talk about here, verse, or ver, two, last two verses, verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Bere the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Why? The Hittites were the Canaanites. We just talked about this, Billy, right? Not part of Abraham's tribe, not part of the people of the promise, but these are the people, the Canaanites, the one that God promised, I'm going to take my land from them and give them to your offspring, Abraham. So is Esau doing his duty? Is, does Esau care about the promise of God? He doesn't seem to. By the way, is it a great thing that he's married to two people? No! <laughs> We're going to see more about bigamy with Jacob, how it's not a great thing at all. It can be a whole, whole mess of things. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca, one man, one woman. Kind of more of the model God has created from the beginning, right? Genesis 1 and 2. 
Uh, but these, Esau becomes a, a bitterness for Isaac and Rebekah. Okay. We got, I think, one more story in us. We've gone through a lot today, I, but, you know, I've, I wanted more. <laughs> Verse 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring to it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. It was customary for the patriarchs, and we see this very, uh, we see this a lot in, with Jacob and his sons, we'll get to that in a couple weeks, that, to give a blessing before the father died, almost having a, a prophetic significance to this, right? The blessing was, was maybe even more important than the birthright. What would your descendants be? Who would you be in comparison to your brothers? Oh, I said, never realized what Esau had done with Jacob to change the inheritance and giving up his inheritance. Well, again, birthright and blessing are two separate things. Right. Okay, uh, I actually got them confused once too. It's actually different. Uh, we'll see this when uh, Esau complains to uh, Isaac. He stole my birthright. Now he's going to steal my blessing too. Uh, they're two separate things. Okay, but again, the blessing was more of the who the prophetic relation you will have to your brothers. Now, who does Isaac want to bless of his two sons? Esau. Why? He's the favorite. He's the hunter boy. Right? And so he says, go bring me some food so I can enjoy your game. And then I will bless you. Verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to, field, to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speaking to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you for the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two young goats, so that I may prepare them for them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Funny sentence in English. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to, me, to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared in the hand of her son, Jacob. So, what's the plan here? Billy. I didn't want to wait for the people to do that and eat You know, the, the woman here, like, don't cross in the... That's a good, okay, that's, that's yeah, an interesting okay. point, right? Yeah. The, the, the original fall in Genesis 3 yeah, was yeah. when the head and helper relationship was you changed, know, right? Kid, okay, go scan the old man, and you'll get the thing which I want to do my favorite. Yes. Yeah. So a husband and wife are not united here yeah. at all. Yeah. What else is going on? What's the plan? What's Rebecca's plan? She wants him to bless like the, her favorite. Which is? Um, Jacob. Jacob. So how is she going to make that happen? Trick him. Trick him. Because Abraham, or I'm sorry, Isaac can't what? See. He can't see. So he can hear and he can feel. And so Esau, we hear from his birth, just had a lot of hair everywhere. He's a hairy guy. And Jacob, not so much. So fathers like to, yes. So we'll put coat, goat skins on you so you feel hairy when he, when he reaches out to touch you. His fathers might want to touch their sons as he's giving them a blessing. A little manipulation here, right? Jacob's name is what? 
heel, the one who grips the heel, he is the? The cheater, the usurper. Well, it's, it's cool. I think we should get back to this in the Old Testament. And I wish we had time today. But all the 12 tribes of Israel, all these sons' names, they all have meaning to them. Words to, and it's actually kind of crazy. Uh, I'll wait. I'll wait till next week. Or, or two weeks after, when it kind of plays out? The, or is it, because of the, like, to your point, they named him Jacob, which means cheater. Like, yes. Did they know it meant Well, uh, uh, again, or was it the meaning again, the direct meaning itself is the one who grips the right. heel, which can also mean usurper, okay. right? Think of someone who wrestles and, and, and right. grabs the heel, I'm right? I'm just wondering, like, what came first, the meaning or, well, naming him that in the beginning? Was, the meaning was attached. Likely, what it was is the actual, when it was, he was born, the word itself was assigned to him. Um, oh, fine. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Oh, gosh. Well, because when, they, remember what he was saying earlier, when the two twins were in the stomach, yeah. Jacob was born, he was grabbing the heel, and mm-hmm. right. the heel, so right. the, Okay, we'll give you. Uh, I, this will not spoil much. If you go to ver- chapter thirty, verse thirteen, and Leah said, "Happy am I, for women have called me happy." So she called his name, his, his her son's name, Asher. Asher means happy, right? So that word is just given to him at, at birth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're going to see a lot more of that when we get back to Rachel and Leah, but that's, that's for next week, or not next week, two weeks from now when I'm back. Uh, okay, um, any questions on that? Okay, uh, where was I? Sorry. I was, oh yeah, verse 19, the deception, or verse 18. So he went into his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. (laughs) Billy didn't like that one. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and ate and brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss him, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, and here's the blessing, The smell of my son is at the smell of the field the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. There's two components to this blessing. One, what people come out of Jacob? The Israelites. Where do the Israelites live? In the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, an abundant land. Here's what Isaac says to Jacob. May God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. The people of Israel were an agricultural people. They did a lot of farming. They, they were blessed in the promised land. This is what God, or this is what Isaac gives to Jacob, which turns into the land of Israel. What else does Isaac say to Jacob? Be Lord over your brothers. So, God prophesied what when Rebekah had the twins in her womb? The younger would be over the elder. The younger would be over the elder. And here it is right here. 
God's word coming true, this irrevocable blessing, prophetic, that Esau would serve Isaac. All right. Where's it all fall apart? <clears throat> Verse 30. Oh, questions on that, by the way. Any questions on the, uh, the blessing? Just a few more minutes. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his Isaac, his father. So uh, Jacob's just leaving the room. Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it in to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. But he said, Your father came, your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Why is that the case? What was the blessing of Jacob? He would rule, it, it can't be both ways. I can't both bless you that. You, you can't have Esau, I bless you, you are over your brothers. Jacob, I bless you, you are over your brothers. It can only be one way, and it was given to Jacob. Let's keep going. Bless me even so, my bro oh, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not, re not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. Because we know what the name Jacob means, which means cheater. cheater. This makes sense to us, right? For he has cheated me now two times. He has took, taken away my birthright, and behold, he has even taken away my blessing. So there it is, Gil. Uh, two separate things, birthright and blessing. Then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau, Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. So this is Esau's blessing. What is Esau told is going to happen to his descendants. Well, not get nothing. You get a sword. He's going to be. He's going to be under his brother's control, uh, but not forever. From Esau would come the Edomites, and off, and throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites had control over the Edomites. The Edomites would be the sojourners. They would be out in the desert somewhere, and the Israelites would be in the land of Canaan, where the land was plentiful. There's only one time, well, a couple times, towards the end of uh, Israel, uh, Israel's dominance that the Edomites finally broke free. It's when all the kings were wicked in Israel, right? And they started to fall away from God, and God allowed the Edomites to uh, escape their control. Uh, that's what happens here. But for now, good news for Esau? Not at all. Questions on this so far? What is breaking a yoke from your neck? Okay, what's a yoke? Do you know what a yoke is? Something you put upon cattle, you put a plow, and the cattle will move forward, almost like a saddle for a horse. A yoke is for cattle to move a plow forward. Right? Yes, so you think it's fun to wear a yoke? Just like it's not fun for a horse? I mean, I don't know if horses really like a 
they get used to it, right? But you break a horse in to actually have that in their mouth first, right? A bridle? What do you mean? Yeah. Um, no, a yoke is a heavy burden, right? The way the way the yoke is described here, that uh, you have a yoke to your brother. Your brother will lord over you. He's a slave almost, right? Why is this not the greatest plan of Jacob and Rebecca? Sure, it works. Sure, but why isn't it a great plan? Jacob's the, the nerdy kid. Esau's the what? The one that's He's the hunter. Uh, do you think uh, Esau's not going to find out what happened? He just did. What do you think Esau's going to do when he finds out that his brother has cheated him of his father's blessing? Yeah! Do you think Esau, do you think Jacob can put up a fight against his brother? Not, not a chance. So let's see what happens. Verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning my father are approaching. Basically the funeral. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her oldest son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran. Remember Laban, the one that uh, allowed Rebekah to go to be Isaac's uh, wife? And stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away. Until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? What's Rebecca's new plan? She's Miss Crafty. Separate them. When Esau comes down, then my beloved boy can come back to me. Do you know this is the last time Rebecca will see Jacob? Rebecca will never see Jacob again. Did that plan backfire a little bit? That Jacob, the, the son who she loved the most, now will never see her again. Uh, does Esau calm down? It takes him like decades. Way, way, way later on. But like, how about for 20 years? Esau is not, it's not like, ah, a week later he chills, chills out. No, Esau, Jacob is constantly worried about his brother for decades. Do you think there might be some regret in this plan? I think there might be a little hidden moral in this idea that deception is not God's will. Even though the Bible does not outright say that to us, because we're just neutral observers here reading history, we can see that Jacob and Rebekah have made a mess of things, dividing a family, as you said, Gil. Questions on that? Rebekah comes to Isaac. Yes. But in all respect, doesn't respect him, even though he's the godly person who yes. God's promised to. And she goes against, and she is the almost the figurehead for the body and the family. Okay. Well we don't have the background story of what all all we have is that Isaac loved Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, here's one thing I could contribute to that, why Isaac might be a little bit more in the wrong here. What was the problem with Esau? He married, he married these Hittites. He was abandoning the promise. Did Isaac do what Abraham did with him? Arrange a marriage so that uh, God's will can be done? So this is going back to Oh, Romeo and Juliet, you find your own. I'll support whoever you marry. Uh, all of a sudden now, Isaac is not actually upholding God's plan that from Abraham's own tribe would come the promised one, the one who would redeem Israel, that would bless all nations. Esau, you know, we feel bad for him, but he's no saint here. He's a very worldly man. In fact, we're not going to have time for today. Um, we'll see in the future. He'll actually marry a third woman. 
a third wife because he, oh, my parents are mad at me because I'm not marrying from Abraham's tribe. So you know what? I'll marry a descendant of Ishmael. Remember Ishmael? Is he in the line of the promise? He was broken off of that. So nice try, nice try, Esau. But Esau, uh, uh, um, Ishmael was the one who was sent into the wilderness. That was no longer the promise. Isaac was the promised line. So even when Esau tries to make amends, he is falling short. But we see that maybe, just maybe, uh, Isaac's great love for Esau was unjustified. Maybe he should have said, Esau, you know, Wake up, because Jacob might be more righteous than you. And that's saying something, because Jacob is not a righteous person at all. It is sad, though, because you feel like Rebecca and Isaac, like, oh, like, they both believed it, and they both were like, and they love each other. And, and then it was like, then it's just so cold. Like, he had his favorite, she had her favorite. And it was just... Rachel, I love that you're talking about this because I think I want to wrap up with that very point. What do we see here? Man, the story sounds... It stories, yes, the story starts off great. But do we have that true, perfect, happy story forever and ever in this life? No. It's not until our redemption and the light to come because of Jesus do we finally have that perfect story. You've noticed this already, Rachel, and you all noticed this. There's not a single perfect story in, we've done so far. All of them have got defects and flaws and mistakes and make a mess of things. That's why we need someone to bless all nations. We need someone to redeem us, to pay the price for our sin. And that will be, that is, it has been Jesus. And it will be when we see him in heaven forever. Because then, finally, we will have these stories that end happy. Then, finally, we will be free of anxiety and favorites and betrayal and deceit and cheating and lying. All that will be wiped away in heaven. The Old Testament is a story about Jesus and just how badly uh, we need him. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments on this Isaac, Rebecca, and Esau and Jacob? We'll spend one more week of Esau and Jacob. Well, maybe two more. We'll see. Um, again, I will not be here next Wednesday, but I will be here the following Wednesday. We're taking a week break, and then uh, we'll jump right back in. And of course, I'm not done with you guys yet. If you've got 10 more minutes, we've got a, a little chosen crypt clip to watch. But let's pray first, shall we? Dear God, Father in heaven, you reveal to us in your, world, your word that, uh, man, and, your, and the world, that we are all broken people. That even stories that start out great sometimes collapse in themselves in a huge mess. And how often our lives can look the very same. But we know you have a plan for us in your son, Jesus, who blesses all the nations of the world by his blood, who has paid the price for our sin. And because of him, we will follow him into the grave and we will follow him out of the grave to life everlasting, to heaven forever. When we finally will have that true fairy tale happiness, you will make it a reality, not because of anything we've done or accomplished, because you love us so much. I pray you would remind us of this each and every day that we might always look to you. I pray that you would bless us this week, keep us safe until we meet each other again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.